Mark 1. Conversations at the speed of sound. I wanted to be a role model for those women so that they could see that a woman in a senior leadership role isn't necessarily a freak, isn't any different to what they are, and if I could do it, then they could too because I was just an ordinary hard-working officer in the military. But the, the other reason that I wanted to go there was to be a role model for the young male cadets as well mm. so that from very early in their career they became used to the idea of a woman being in command and that they would think, well, this is nothing out of the ordinary. This is what I will expect in my career uh, as a junior officer progressing through the ranks. Hello and welcome to Mac One, the podcast of the Queensland Air Museum Caloundra. So nice of you to join me today. My name is Gary Hills. I am delighted to say that I am a Queensland Air Museum volunteer and I'll be your host for this episode where you'll hear a conversation I had recently with RAAF Air Vice Marshal retired and Queensland Air Museum member Julie Hammer. It's a cracker. Just before we get to that, you know, I think it's probably true to say that for most of us, certainly for many of us, our only first-hand experience with aviation is as passengers on commercial airliners or in general aviation, and that the person who, or the people who, greet us, look after us on a flight, and to a large extent, make sure that our experience of flying is a good one, are those that we call cabin crew, flight attendants, what used to be called air hostesses or hosties or stewardesses. I spoke recently with three retired cabin crew members, flight attendants. One worked for British Airways, one for ANA, Australian National Airways, and one for ANSET Australia. And they all have fantastic stories to tell. So that's coming next week. We'll be talking to the cabin crew. But for now, this is my conversation recently with Julie Hammer. Well, I'm in the QAM studio with a special guest today, RAAF Air Vice Marshal retired Julie Hammer, who's also a Queensland Air Museum member. Hello, Julie. Hi, Gary. Good of you to join me. Thank you for this. Um, you have such a perspective of, of, uh, of great interest to me and to our listeners. So let's start with the general question that I ask most of our guests. Where are you from and what is your background in aviation? Well, I'm a Brisbane girl, uh, born and raised in Brisbane, did all my study in Brisbane uh, school and then on to the University of Queensland uh, where I studied physics and maths. When, when I went to university, I didn't really know what I uh, wanted to do as a career. So I just studied the things that I was good at and the subjects that I really liked. And towards the end of my study, uh, I became aware that the Air Force was wanting to employ maths and physics graduates as education officers. And uh, I thought, well, that might be good as a career for a few years until a proper job comes mm -hmm. along. And what do you know, that turned into a 28-year career. 28 years. And so, and as I said in the introduction, uh, you retired with two-star rank of Air Vice Marshal. What was the Air Force like for women when you joined? Well, I joined in 1977 and at that time the WAF, the Women's Royal Australian Air Force, still existed and uh, a lot of women who were in the WAF were starting to branch out into expanded roles but the Royal Australian Air Force, the male Air Force, were also beginning to recruit women into their male ranks, traditionally male ranks. So to be an education officer in the Royal Australian Air Force was quite a new thing at that time. The first 
female officer in the RAF was only recruited in 1976, Mm. uh, a few months before me. Mm. And it was a bit confusing for the old and bold because uh, they weren't used to having females sporting the male ranks and uh, they considered that we weren't necessarily equal. The thing that we weren't equal in, even though we were equal in rank, we were not equal in pay. So even though we were RAF officers at that time, uh, we were paid WAF pay, which was only around about 80% of the male pay. But that all changed not very long after I joined because uh, the WAF and the RAF merged and everyone became RAAF and the equal pay was brought in and backdated to the date of amalgamation. So uh, the inequality didn't last for too long. That is so good to hear. Um, Now, 28 years, that's uh, a lot must have happened. There must be key milestones that you could point to when you look back on your career. There were. There were a few that uh, I'd like to share. Certainly when I joined as an education officer, women were not permitted to be engineers. They weren't permitted to be air crew. The opportunities for women then were as administrative officers, as education officers, and there were a few young women going into air traffic control and what we, in those days, equipment officers, we now call them logistics officers, Mm. But uh, a lot of the more tr- um, core roles like engineering, um, the aviation roles of um, air crew were not open to women. But engineering opened to women only a couple of years after I joined. And really the first major milestone in my career was when a colleague suggested to me that I should apply to transfer to engineering. And I said, well, I can't really because I haven't got an engineering degree. And he said to me, well, you've got a very technical degree and you've studied electronics, electromagnetic theory, ionospheric physics and uh, transmission lines (laughs) and all of these other subjects that were very relevant to what in those days was called... Uh, radio engineer category and so I thought about it and thought well it's worth a while to give it a go and uh, I subsequently applied to transfer to engineering and that really opened up a whole new career for me as more a core discipline in the Air Force than I Mm. think education had been Mm. and um, that set me on a path to uh, very much a, a more technical focus in the Air Force. Perhaps the second key milestone was being offered the opportunity to go to the UK and study with the RAF on what was uh, qu- colloquially known as the Air Systems course. It was um, a master's degree in um, both aeronautical engineering and electronics. It basically cross-trained you in those disciplines and uh, gave you a master's degree in aerosystems engineering. And I was very grateful for that because not only did it give me a technology update 10 years into my career, but it also gave me that degree after my name that had engineering in it rather than science and uh, something that stood me in good stead uh, for those who were doubting my qualifications to be doing what I was doing. Mm. So uh, I was very grateful for that opportunity and um, uh, think that any opportunity to learn more is one that should be grasped with both hands. And then perhaps the third real milestone was uh, when I was appointed to be the commanding officer of the Electronic Warfare Squadron. And that was an opportunity that I actively sought when I knew that the job was coming up. 
This was uh, dating back to around about 1990. And I was involved at that time in the Air Force's largest electronic warfare project, fitting the new ESM system to the maritime patrol aircraft, to the P3s. And I had been the project engineer on that uh, very major project and then the project manager. And I'd also done a tour in um, the Joint Intelligence Organisation as a technical intelligence analyst immediately prior to that. And all of that experience was very relevant to the role of commanding officer of Electronic Warfare Squadron. It was a very new squadron at that time. It had only been established in 1989 and the first commanding officer was coming up to his time to be replaced. And I really aspired for that job, not only because I had quite a bit of experience in electronic warfare by then, but also because it was a command role which I actively sought uh, as something I aspired to. To have a command in the Air Force is really... Most people think it's the pinnacle of um, your career. And so I knew that I would not even be considered for that role because it was an aircrew job. All of the uh, jobs in those days, the, the plum jobs were kept for the, the winged warriors. And so um, I went to the posting officer and said, uh, look, you're looking for the next COVW squadron, and uh, you're looking for someone who's got experience in software development, experience in intelligence, and experience in electronic warfare technologies. And I said, I'm the person for the job, but you're not even going to look at me. So um, being the enlightened gentleman that he was, he actually got... Um, sanction to open up the selection process to more than just air crew and uh, lo and behold my name happened to pop out of the process with the most ticks against it and uh, I was appointed electronic the CEO of the electronic warfare squadron. The reason that that was a major milestone in my career was not just because it gave me that uh, command role and the tick in the box that is deemed to be necessary for higher rank, but it also gave me the opportunity to interact uh, very closely with Army and Navy colleagues and with a lot of the defence civilian operational Mm. world and intelligence world and uh, form relationships that really stood me in very, very good stead for the future where in my later career I ended up in a lot of joint roles um, and I already had good relationships with a lot of the people I was working with. Well, if I may, as a civilian, congratulations uh, on achieving something so significant and uh, I can understand why you would call that a key milestone for sure. So what what roles in the Air Force gave you the most satisfaction, would you say? Well, I would have to say it was the command roles. I, I thoroughly enjoyed being a leader and it was uh, my approach to leadership is more one of um, enabling a team to excel rather than telling a team what to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the Electronic Warfare Squadron was probably – that by far the, in some ways, easiest role to to fulfil as a leader because it was a new squadron. It was doing new and exciting work. Every person there had been handpicked to go there because the Air Force really wanted this squadron to succeed. So they were all highly qualified, all highly motivated and the work was so interesting. It was in a highly secure facility. We had one door in and the same door out, and it was like a bank vault door. So we were we were locked in there like um, a, an exclusive little team, 
all thoroughly enjoying the work that we were doing. So from a leadership point of view, it was a breeze. It was just an easy job. The technology and the work we were doing wasn't easy, but um, the team was fabulous. Volunteering can be good for your physical health and mental well-being. Get active and get involved with interesting tasks, significant and important projects and meet new people by joining the volunteers at the Queensland Air Museum Caloundra, where all volunteers here. Whether it's in our restoration workshops and our aero engine shop, restoring and maintaining airframes and engines, as well as our grounds and buildings, or in our library, boasting one of the largest and most significant collections of RAAF materials in Australia, with tens of thousands of items to be catalogued, administered and cared for. Or on our front counter, providing excellent customer service to our visitors. There's a place for you. It could be one day a week or seven. We will train you and equip you for the area that suits you best. Get in touch through our website. We would love to hear from you. Become a volunteer at the Queensland Air Museum, Caloundra. The second leadership role that was nowhere near as pleasurable, but in many, many ways was far more challenging and I guess in in a sense more satisfying because it was so hard was when I went into this innocuous sounding role called Director General Information Services and it, it technically wouldn't even be considered a leadership role. Uh, it would be considered a staff role but in fact it was um, the, the organisation that headed up the management of defences, communications and IT networks, all the strategic communications, not the tactical comms. Uh, And it was just after the Y2K uh, event, which happened to be a non-event in in the end, Uh, and it was at a time when all of the previously dispersed and disparate IT networks, small and large within defence, had all been um, drawn, pushed, shoved, coerced into a single organisation and we were trying to make sense of a myriad of technologies Mm. and hardware and software and trying to make defence's IT work as a single network. It was a huge challenge. when I went into the job, we didn't even know how many people we had in the organisation, where all of the the um, hardware and software was. We, we really had to do an inventory of both people and uh, networks and equipment to figure out what we even had. And over the two years that I was there, we really worked extremely hard to turn that organisation around and to homogenise and uh, rationalise defences, comms and IT networks. And we made significant progress. Again, I had a fabulous team of senior leaders working for me. I was a one star at that time and, and the next rank down was a mix of group captain, colonel level officers as well as um, public servants. So we were a highly integrated military and public service team. Mm. Uh, And we we ended up realising that what we had in our grasp was about 1,500 people in about 160 locations across Australia supporting Defence's secret network of 12,000 users and at that time the restricted network of about 80,000 users. So that was quite a significant task and, as I said, the most challenging and probably the most rewarding leadership role I had. 
That's mind-boggling to me, just hearing you <laughs> talk about that. I can understand what you're saying about how satisfying that would be. Um, the, the third leadership role, if I may, that please, I, I'd yes. just like to mention briefly was um, when I was appointed to be the Commandant of the Defence Force Academy. And that was, uh, again, as a one-star, it was immediately after my role in the um, communications IT area. And another role that I sought actively as I had for Electronic Warfare Squadron. And the reason I wanted to go to ADFA and uh, take over a, a leadership role there was not just because I loved leadership roles and I wanted another one, but because at ADFA some 20% of the cadet population at that time were females and I wanted to be a role model for those women so that they could see that a woman in a senior leadership role isn't necessarily a freak, isn't any different to what they are and if I could do it then they could too because I was just an ordinary hard-working officer in the military. But the, the other reason that I wanted to go there was to be a role model for the young male cadets as well mm. so that from very early in their career they became used to the idea of a woman being in command and that they would think, well, this is nothing out of the ordinary. This is what I will expect in my career uh, as a junior officer progressing through the ranks. Well, and having said that, I mean, you were the first woman in the Australian Defence Force to be promoted to one star, to Air Commodore, and subsequently two stars as Air Vice Marshal. So what were the challenges you faced as the only senior star-ranked woman? It was both positive and negative, actually, because what I came to realise as I was getting more and more senior, and I think it started probably when I was promoted to group captain was that whatever I did was going to be visible and therefore it was really important that I project the right image to my peers and to all the young women coming through the Defence Force after me. And it wasn't just the Air Force. I, I was surprised in a, on a number of occasions to realise that I was visible to the Army and Navy women as well. And so I came to realise that whatever I did, I had to do with great care and consideration uh, so that I didn't make silly mistakes in uh, anything I did and so that I portrayed a senior officer with dignity and intelligence. It was also very positive in many ways because I, being the only senior female, it was a time where defence wanted female representation on a lot of the activities that they were doing. So, for example, the Chief of Air Force wanted to have a female sitting in on his advisory committee meetings. So even though I wasn't in an Air Force job at the time, I would attend and work, read all the papers for and make comment where appropriate on anything that Air Force was doing on the Chief of Air Staff Advisory Committee. Uh, I was asked to participate in many other fora where they needed a, a female of sufficient experience mm. to be able to contribute. And so that actually created a lot of extra work for me, but it was also an enormous privilege to be able to do that and to have the opportunities again to interact in many areas that my colleagues didn't necessarily get the same opportunity to participate in. So I... Uh, as I said, I think the positives certainly outweigh 
the the challenges. I'd rather use the word challenges than negatives. Um, but it was an awful lot of work <laughs> and uh, a lot of pleasure. Mm. So as you reflect back now on your Air Force career, is there anything that you would have changed? Gary, I wouldn't have changed a thing. Julie Hammer, thank you so much for talking to us. It's been an utter delight. Thank you. It was so good talking with Julie. Just that little snapshot of her 28-year career with the Royal Australian Air Force. Thank you again to Julie. And look, don't forget, Queensland Air Museum, 7 Pathfinder Drive, Caloundra, right across the road from the Caloundra Aerodrome. We're open from 10 till 4 every day except Christmas Day and Easter Friday. We would love to meet you. And if you come into the Air Museum and you've listened to the podcast, let us know that. We'd like to know that you're listening so that we can meet you. We uh, look forward to uh, your company next week in our next episode when we talk to cabin crew. Thanks for listening today. Come and see us soon. Bye for now.